I know that in the aging journey, we see these changes to epigenetics that underpin morbidity and mortality. These changes to DNA methylation patterns really seem to drive the chronic diseases of aging, and they seem to drive aging itself. Welcome to the Seamland Podcast. I'm your host, Seam Lund, and our guest today is Dr. Cara Fitzgerald. Dr. Cara is a naturopathic doctor and an author. She was one of the authors of a 2021 study that showed for the first time biological age reversal in humans. She also has a book called Younger You. This episode is brought to you by Bond Charge, formerly known as Blue Blocks. My favorite light and sea pulmonization companies, Blue Blocks, has rebranded themselves as Bond Charge. They're now involved with a huge range of evidence-based products to improve your wellness and life in every way. Their extensive range of premium wellness products helps you to sleep better, perform better, have more energy, recover faster, balance your hormones, and reduce inflammation. My favorites are their red light light bulbs because they can be used to create a melatonin-friendly environment in your bedroom by shining only red and not blue or green light waves that will reduce your sleep quality. After starting to use these red light light bulbs, I find it much easier to fall asleep and feel less awake before bed. If you want to try out these amazing products that are the cornerstones to my most optimal sleep, then head over to bondcharge.com forward slash seamlund and use the code seam15 to save 15%. Dr. Kara, welcome to the show. It's great to be with you today. Like a last year when uh, you had this published a study where you show the, the, the in humans you were able to reverse biological age by uh, over three years. Uh, I actually did a video as well <laughs> about like, you know, talking about it and uh, yeah, I think it is quite of like a pretty, you know, important study in that sense. It's actually one of the first ones, if I'm not mistaken, where uh, it has been shown to actually reverse the biological age in humans. Um, so uh, maybe let's start off, you know, <laughs> maybe you give a brief overview about the study and uh, what did you uh, discover and how did you yes. do it? Yes, absolutely. I Well, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for your interest in my work and thanks for publishing a video on it. That's that's very cool. Um you know, we were, we were the first uh, randomized control trial uh, and the first using a, a multimodal diet and lifestyle intervention. Um, so a lot of, lot of firsts for this and it, it got us a great deal of attention, you know, globally, hence my conversation with you now. Um, it was, I, so I want to, I just want to say, so at the, when we were designing our study, there were no human studies at that time showing reversal or reduction in biological age. It wasn't thought to be possible. And this was just 2018 when we launched our trial. Uh, so things are moving very fast in this world. And I want to say, so why did we even think we could? I don't think at the time we were designing our study that we necessarily thought we were going to reverse bioage. It just hadn't been published on. In fact, Horvath, who developed the clock, didn't think that it was possible at that time. I mean, he's on record saying it. Um, but I did have confidence. I actually had a lot of confidence, perhaps cavalierly so, that we would change epigenetic expression, that we would change DNA methylation patterns uh, for the better. So I, I thought that we could do that. And that was what we wanted to look at. I know that in the aging journey, we see these changes to epigenetics um, that that are that underpin uh, morbidity and mortality. These changes to DNA methylation patterns really seem to drive the chronic diseases of aging, and they seem to drive aging itself. So we had that. We went into our study with our with with those expectations. And I still have to publish on those data. We in fact did change DNA methylation much more broadly than than just simply the bioage clock. So that's how we started the journey. And then of course our first publication, as you know, was this extraordinary finding that as compared to controlled, we were we reversed bioage um, by over three years. We um it was an eight-week study, which hasn't hasn't been done either. Most of these human trials now are, are longer. Like there's a rapamycin trial going on now. And I think um, if I believe it's, if I, I think it's six months in Australia, um, mm. but most studies are longer. Um, we used a diet that we'll talk about in detail. We wanted people to sleep well. We wanted them to meditate briefly a couple times per day. We wanted them to exercise. Uh, we had them take a probiotic and we had them take a greens powder um, and they worked with our nutrition team. Importantly, they met with the nutrition uh, coaches weekly. Um, and I think our adherence numbers 
speak to the influence of that contact. You know, it kept them on track. Um, it was a, a, a pilot study, uh, small. So we had 18 men, middle-aged men. Uh, you know, middle age is when you really start to pick up these changes in DNA methylation. So we wanted a middle-aged population. Um, and then 20 in our control group. So a total of, of, of 38 individuals. Um, what else do I want to say? They were healthy. And this is really important. Uh, we were not looking at people who had diabetes or prediabetes or any, really any demonstrable uh, diagnosis or mm. present. We wanted healthy men. Um, it took us a while to recruit them all. Uh, but I think that also speaks to the power of our intervention that we were able to favorably shift that. So let me just stop there and see if you have any questions for mm. me. Yeah. Yeah. So, and in the end, you saw like a reduction in about three something uh, point uh, years in the biological age. Yes, as compared to our controls, 3.24 years, yes. Compared to themselves at baseline, um, a little over two years. Nice. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's actually pretty significant, given the fact that, you know, it becomes harder to stay healthy the older you get. And uh, yeah, this kind of downward spiral that tends to happen with uh, with aging. Um, yes. But uh, I mean, like many people may not be even aware of the concept of uh, biological age and epigenetic age. And, yes. Uh, not to mention that it's actually you know, possible to reverse that. So uh, can you also give yes. us like, what is, what is this uh, biological age and how does it differ from the chronological age? Yeah, of course. That's a very good, extremely important foundational question. Chronological age is just the number of birthdays we've celebrated, the number of years we've, we've been alive. Um, it's going to be a number that we really don't think about in, you know, at some point in time. It's not going to be the relevant concern. <laughs> You're, we're going to want to know people's bio age uh, mm -hmm. way more. So biological age is the rate of physical aging, the actual aging process. And if we think about, uh, you know, friends uh, from from high school or earlier and, you know, you haven't seen them for some years and then you have a, you know, here in the States, there's annual high school reunions, people gather. And there's always there's always individuals who look fabulously well and you have no they haven't changed at all their energy is the same their vitality they look the same and then there's other people who have deteriorated significantly and they're all the same age we all went to high school together i mean it's an extraordinary phenomenon what's interesting too is that humans are actually pretty sensitive to this like we can pick up fairly reliably people who are biologically aging faster um, than their chronological age. But so we can very clearly identify folks who are fabulously fit and healthy and uh, others that are that are not doing so well. So that's biological age. And you know we did we were not able to measure it. I'm sure that you've discussed telomeres, telomere length on your podcast. Uh, that was at one time the gold standard measurement of the rate of aging, the biological age. Um, but it was supplanted by um, by looking at DNA methylation by epigenetic clocks or DNA methylation clocks. They're sometimes referred to, um, and so there are multiple generations of these clocks out. The technology is evolving rapidly. There were the, the, in our study we used a first generation clock, and now they're up to third generation clocks. But these are looking at patterns of gene expression, um, and it's called the science of epigenetics and uh, it's a much more rigorous way of of measuring uh, the aging process. Right, and uh, how, what is like based on epigenetics then? Correct, that's right. So patterns of DNA methylation. Yeah. So epigenetics. Let me just back up too, and and don't hesitate to stop me if this is redundant or if I if you need a clarifying question, don't hesitate to just cut me right off. Um, you know, we mapped the genome out, the human genome was uh, figured out back in about 2003. And we thought that we would, from that information, be able to identify diseases, what causes diabetes, what causes heart disease, what causes dementia, what causes cancer, et cetera. We thought that we would have that information once we identified the genome. We did not. We, it was, I, I'm, I'm sure that scientists hard at work or, or scientists looking at those results were really disappointed that it wasn't the Rosetta Stone of the causes of chronic disease. And, but that catapulted us into the study, into epigenetics. And that is this epi above genetics, the genes. It's the study of gene expression. 
It's the biochemical marks on top of the genetic material that influence which gene is turned on and which gene is turned off during the aging journey actually during any time in the in, in our in our life we want the best genes obviously the most healthful genes turned on and we want those that are going to promote disease turned off as we age predictably we start to turn on genes we don't want on and we start to turn off genes we want on inflammatory genes get turned on you know genes that fight cancer get turned off like all sorts of mess so we can, one of the fundamental epigenetic marks, if you will, one of the fundamental biochemical processes is something called DNA methylation. Uh, a methyl group is just a carbon with three hydrogens, if people go back to their high school biochemistry. And when you put a lot of these carbon, these, 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 these methyl groups on to a promoter region of a gene, that gene is inhibited. Right. Gotcha. And uh, yeah, it's so, so um, you know, important to uh, acknowledge <laughs> that. And I think, you know, that, that, that the theory itself is uh, relatively new as well. The uh, this epigenetic clock theory of aging. So maybe like only like 10 years old or something. Yeah. So the first clock, um, the first clocks were developed in, yeah, yeah, 10 years ago. Yeah, it's great. It's crazy. I mean, I think the ideas predated that a little bit, but yes, it's new technology. Um, yeah. And how accurate is it? Uh, like, how many studies have it, have been done on that? And you know, what's the like? Is there any correlation? Actual, like, real world correlation? Um. I mean, obviously, humans live a long time, so we need surrogate markers. You know, we can't. Um, it would just, you know, it'd be a, a 80 year study for us to actually really yeah. do a side by side comparison. Um, but more and more studies are coming out to really suggest their utility. Um, let's see, a, a recent one that um, I'll send to you, I'll give you the link. It's, it was a pretty cool study. They were looking at a massive database. So they were looking at uh, women over uh, 90 and above in the duration of the study, 90 and above. And they were able to clearly demonstrate, and this is a recent publication, that those who were cognitively intact, um, that those who were, who were physically strong, able to move, exercise, et cetera, were biologically uh, significantly younger than their age-matched counterparts. Uh, so I thought that was a cool, pretty validating study. Um, there's other, you know, of course, we've, we've, we've compared caloric restriction, um, you know, using it in the study group as compared to a, a, a non-calorically restricted control. That appears to slow the rate of aging. Um, what else? We've, there, there have been a host of different, of different studies showing uh, accelerated aging, in brain tissue of Alzheimer patients or accelerated aging in individuals with vitamin D deficiency, um, accelerated aging in individuals, in older individuals with COVID, et cetera. So, we, so the, these clocks have been used uh, in a variety of different ways to kind of perceive uh, the aging phenomena. Right. Um, and they've also been used, there's, there's a clock called a, 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 a mammalian clock that shows efficacy across all mammals. Um, but I do want to, I do want to say that, I guess I want to say two things. One, I'm very excited about the possibility and promise of these clocks. Um, and, but the, it, but it is true. The technology is in, well, I should, it's not a, but, and the technology is, is evolving. So we want to go in and use these tools with our eyes open, you know, knowing that the technology is evolving. So there's that. Uh, but the but the promise is extraordinary. It's ex very exciting time. Uh, it's a revolutionary time, really, in science and medicine because of these are a piece of it. Mm. Um, yeah. uh, the other piece that I want to say, though, so love the clocks, use them if you want to, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 
but still our old school biomarkers are reliable. You know, what's your BMI? What's your, you know, waist to hip ratio? What's your blood pressure? Is your, you know, are various inflammatory markers elevated? Is your white blood cell count high? You know, is your red blood cell count too low, et cetera? So we can use old standby markers. There's a protein in circulation that's very cheap to measure called albumin, uh, and that's a marker of longevity itself. So we can we we can look to these clocks and the promise of these clocks and we can use them, but we shouldn't uh, eliminate, you know, tried and true uh, 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 biomarkers as well. Mm, yeah. So obviously like a combination of both <laughs> is the best. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, then like the DNA methylation or the clocks look at these patterns of DNA methylation and certain patterns are associated with a certain age and yes. uh, certain patterns are associated with older age, etc. So it's looking at like this correlations between the data that we've, that, uh, we've uh, seen in studies uh, of what certain patterns look like, of, of like what age a certain pattern yes. is, essentially. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so the early clock, the clock we used, um, it's amazing that, you know, we used the newest clock at the time, but it's there's already, you know, subsequent generations out. Where those original clocks were trained against chronological age, but there's also clocks that are trained on um, health status. There's a clock that 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 that's that's that looks at that can predict time to death. I mean, so they're 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 training them against um, uh, different variables these days. But all of the original clocks were trained against chronological age. Although amazingly enough, so they were designed to be able to sort of predict chronological age, except that they weren't a one-to-one, -one. It was there was a little bit of wiggle room in there. And that wiggle room is um, was a more reliable predictor of morbidity and mortality. So the, so the clocks designed to predict chronological age were better at predicting health status um, and, and death than chronological age is, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have like an idea, but I don't think it's a good idea. But like if you had like this continuous some sort of sensor that is you know based on this uh, time to death clock <laughs> and you have like, <laughs> you know, on, the, on the wall you have you have you know 500 uh, days until their death or whatever i think that would put <laughs> it would be like a lot of like fear um, inducing but it's also like very like puts into perspective a bit like how much time you have left <laughs> isn't that crazy that's amazing yeah you yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could, and, and that particular clock is called is aptly named Grim Age, mm. you know, for the Grim Reaper. Yeah, <laughs> isn't that crazy? Yeah, somebody could sell, sell like a little, um, you know, digital time to death. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's horrible. I don't think I would really want that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what what is you know, you know, it's, it's like a big question, but like what is causing those DNA uh, markers to go? Yes bad or what is oh going my gosh. Eating in that sense yeah that's such a good question actually you know just thinking about the grim age your idea which is so funny i mean maybe that would be motivating for some of us right to see yeah. time ticking away there <laughs> on the wall um yeah so what causes aging i mean that is the huge question that um you know is really preoccupying those um, biogerontologists studying it and people kind of fall into different camps. And I did talk about that in the book. Um, so there's there's the camp that suggests that aging is kind of is, is random damage, you know, just random damage, extra, you know, oxidative stress, breaking things down, um, toxin exposures, et cetera. Proteins are no longer folding correctly. Sort of just this, this physiologic deterioration is, is occurring um, uh, without, uh, some, I just, I guess, just really for lack of a better word, just, just somewhat randomly or un, un, unpredictably, I guess, depending on the environmental exposures you've experienced over your life. Um, but then there's another group suggesting that, um, and a lot, and actually I should say that a lot of this is scientists recognize that the aging phenomena does appear to um, originate in the epigenome. So if you want to talk about root cause aging, we sometimes talk about what well, we always talk about in functional medicine, root causes of disease. We can say the root cause of aging appears to be housed in epigenetic changes. Um, so the camp that thinks that, that it's 
that it's a random breakdown. But then there are those of us who really think there's a programmed phenomena. So there's a programmed um, mortality built in. And these chronic diseases of aging are part of the program to um, prompt death within a certain window. And the life expectancy in the United States these days is about 75. Um, it seems that we can, you know, the outliers um, can go up to maybe 120 at the, you know, at the outset. Um, mm. And so these, this, this would present as predictable changes to DNA methylation, which does seem to happen, you know, in my read on the literature predictably inflammation gets turned on. So inflammatory genes are turned on. Predictably cancer increases um, and the genes that protect us from cancer are shut down. Um, and then I want to talk about just quickly, and then I'll stop, is you know the work over at David Sinclair's lab at Harvard, where they're showing this phenomena. They're causing aging in an animal model by basically messing up epigenetics messing up DNA methylation and other marks. And then they reverse aging by restoring DNA methylation and other, wow. other epigenetic processes. Yeah, the first study that they published, which was so, so cool, they caused an age-related optic neuropathy. So they basically, they made these, these mice became blind because of an age-related neuropathy. Um, and then they reversed it using Yamanaka factors. These are transcription factors that change epigenetic expression and in, in, and in particular DNA methylation and demethylation. So then they use these Yamanaka factors um, and were able to restore vision. And when they measured the biological age of those optic neurons, they were youthful. I mean, isn't that amazing? So they did this eye sight study initially, and then they actually used an animal model of aging and they were able to make, they were able to create age and then they were able, able to restore youth. Uh, using Yamanaka factors. I mean, is that ex that's just mind blowing to me? Is that extraordinary? Yeah, and I mean, that it's crazy. Yeah, like you know, you can <laughs> <laughs> turn back the clock literally in the thing that is caused by aging. And uh, yeah, like I wouldn't imagine that you know it's that's that it's that far away from humans. Like it's probably quite close. Well, um, it's extraordinary to me, and it and I mean, and it and it and it suggests that aging is something that's really happening. You know, causally in the in epigenetic changes. Yeah, it's, you know, certainly there are, there are many, many, many billions of dollars moving towards solving this within humans. Many, many labs are turning their attention, big private labs, like, you know, the Jeff Bezos funded Altos lab uh, here and in other parts of the world. Is, they're certainly looking at these questions in a big way, but we do know Yamanaka factors uh, aren't, that previous experiments using Yamanaka factors haven't uh, always been safe. So how we use these safely um, is, you know, the huge, one of the huge questions. Mm, right. So they prompted cancer, you know, tumor genesis and, and so forth. Gotcha. Like, how do you induce them? Like, is there any activity? Does, you, does your body produce them naturally or some compounds? Mm -hmm. Yeah, your body does make Yamanaka factors naturally. Yes, they're transcription factors. So they're little proteins that, you know, that induce, um, DNA uh, genetic transcription. Um, we do make them, um, they're present in stem cells, um, um, but, but Yamanaka, you know, the namesake of these compounds, who now, by the way, is at, base, is, is at Altos lab, the Jeff Bezos funded lab, uh, figured out how to, you know, isolate and, and synthesize these and using them. So the first incredible experiment, the one for which he won the Nobel was um, using Yamanaka factors, he was able to take a fully developed cell and bring it back to pluripotent stem cell status. So he took it all the way back to the beginning. Um, amazing. And, and so what uh, Sinclair is doing at Harvard is he's not bringing animals back to stem cell status. Um, he's using a you know, different combination, different strengths. There's four Yamanaka factors. I think Sinclair is only using three um, and he's not using the same potency that would bring things back, bring a, a, a cell, cells back to pluripotent stem cell status. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, but let's return a bit to back to the methylation. So um, like what is, you know, how do you, let's say, uh, optimize it or what's the kind of 
recipe or how do you yeah improve it or you know is too much is it do you need more do you need less or yeah what's the kind of the situation there mm -hmm. uh, yeah really good question um if, it, if we need it, so, so methylation is a nutrient dense process. Um, anybody who knows that folate and B12 are good for them or eggs are good for them because they contain a compound called choline um, or beets because they have betaine, all of these compounds help make the methylation cycle. So the um, to make those little carbon with three hydrogens, um, to put methyl groups onto DNA, and it does a lot, methyl, methyl groups are operating in the body, doing things in the body in every cell all of the time. So this it's a ubiquitous biochemical process as important and fundamental to life as say breathing is. Um, so we're making these carbons with three hydrogens all of the time in the methylation cycle. It's very nutrient dense. Um, again, folate, B12, betaine from beets, choline from eggs and other nutrients, uh, major important players. But do we just want to make more methyl donors? Do we just want more of these methyl groups? And no, I, the answer is no. We, we, we need a lot of them. We need this cycle always running, but we don't want to just make more. We want balance. Recall when I said that good genes are methylated and turned off. When a good gene is turned off, the genes that protect us from cancer, for example, this is most famously studied. In cancer, the cancer tumor microenvironment hijacks our epigenetics and turns off good genes. It turns off these termosuppressor genes. Same thing happens as we age. As we age, we turn off these protective tumor suppressor genes. So they've got lots of methyl groups on them. So that would suggest that we don't want to just simply load our body up with the ingredients to make more methyl groups. We need to, we do need more of those methyl groups. Let me, let me just add a nuance to this. It's kind of complicated and, you know, just ask me any clarifying questions. As if you were to measure what they call the methylome, that is all of the methyl groups on our genetic material, when we're young, and then when we age, you'll see that as we age, we don't methylate as efficiently, there's a net loss in methylation. So yes, we have to have these methyl groups. But when you zero in and look at genes, look at certain genes, you'll see some in the aging process very predictably have a lot of methyl groups on them and some have a few methyl groups. So there's this disorder in methylation. So yes, thing one is absolutely need lots of, of, of foods that contain methyl groups or help us make methyl groups. And then thing two is nutrients that we think help with the placement that help optimize where methylation is happening. Um, and that's a whole group of nutrient of epinutrients. These are both epinutrients um, that we call methylation adaptogens. I refer to as methylation adaptogens in the book. They seem to help direct where methylation happens towards an optimal pattern. These are nutrients that we know are good for us, including green tea, uh, turmeric, um, or curcumin and turmeric, um, blueberries, resveratrol and grapes, um, uh, what else? Rosmarinic acid and rosemary and on and on. There's hundreds, methane or sulforaphane and cruciferous veggies. A lot of the nutrients that we, we eat because they're good for us have some of these important traffic directing combinations. So as far as diet is concerned, um, I think that we need a fabulous abundance of these epinutrients. We need to be eating them at every meal. Hmm. Yeah, that's, I do agree. And, um, you know, most people don't really uh, consume those foods, obviously. And, uh, yeah, they're maybe, they may be getting like too much of certain uh, donors and not others. And so this kind of imbalance in their uh, diet and uh, in their methylation cycle as well. I talk, So one of the other things I talked about in the book was, well, if it were just a matter of increasing methyl groups, we could all just take supplemental folate and B12 and live forever, right? And of course, that doesn't happen. Yeah, I, there, there are some reasons for concern with excessively pushing methylation forward. Um, you're right. I think people tend not to get adequate amounts of the correct combinations. And that's, you know, that's what we really argue for in our book. And that's what we studied. I do want to tell people, though, that... Um, 
there are loads. There's a, I, I, I created a 30 page epinutrient um, appendix that, you know, you can just look at the hundreds and hundreds of foods that have these important compounds in them. And even the pickiest eater among us is likely eating some epinutrients. So I just, I tell people who are nervous about starting the program to just go back into the appendix with a, you know, yellow highlighter pen and just highlight all of the things that they're already eating, all of the things that they'd be willing to at least try. And you'll see that there's a lot, you know, there's a lot out there that they're, that they can start with. Mm. Is coffee also like an epinutrient? Because I know that that appears to have like some uh, health benefits in terms of, you know, Alzheimer's and uh, cancer and those things. Yeah. And longevity. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah. Coffee is an epinutrient. I, I'm a coffee drinker. <laughs> yeah. Thank God it's an epinutrient. <laughs> um, the only concern obviously is the caffeine with coffee. Um, and then the tan it's very tannic. So some people it bothers folks stomach or if you, if you eat too much, it can be an irritant in the stomach, mm. but, um, you know, clearly the caffeine, even as caffeine has some health benefits, obviously, if it makes you jittery or anxious and you can't sleep, it, it's a problem. So you just need to consume coffee if you like it uh, early in the day or minimally if you don't tolerate it well. Mm. And some of those foods that you mentioned already have basically like real life, real world kind of proof as well a little bit. Uh, yes. And, you know, this uh, green tea is a very yes. popular in Japan and China and uh Uh, yes. obviously red wine and uh, grapes and blueberries etc as well kind of in this mediterranean diet yeah yeah turmeric you know the curcumin and turmeric yeah these are tried and true nutrients that we know and love really time immemorial across cultures these have been designated the smart nutrients my suspicion is that it's because they favorably influence epigenetics you know gene expression so when we we know as a as a as a group they're anti-inflammatory they're anti-cancer they're antioxidant you know they're neuroprotective um there's there there are so many important they you know they're they they, they help with mitochondrial health etc there's just so many beneficial components to these um and i think that they're probably exerting that influence very very upstream, very root cause on changing gene expression. Mm. And maybe as we, you know, research these more and more, we'll, we'll actually see that. Right. What was what the mechanism or like, um, because uh, some of them can also cause like this hormetic, like xenohormesis is this uh, phenomenon yeah. that, that these plant compounds cause like a little bit of stress to the body and uh, boost in antioxidant events. And so yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So how is that happening? I mean, I would say that, Um, well, we know, I mean, we know from in vitro data and some limited animal studies that they can, um, actually maybe there's more than limited, there's, there, there's just not a, enough human data, but it'll come that they can influence the behavior of enzymes involved in, um, DNA methylation. Yeah, so they can have an inhibitory effect on those. So they can allow for the re-expression of some genes. And in some cases, they can actually, depending on what's going on, they can actually um, both inhibit, but also promote uh, these enzymes activities. So it's, so it's really, truly adaptogenic. Like they can, it, in some cases, in some cases, sort of, you know, don't put the methyl group here, put it here. Don't put it here, put it here. I mean, it's, it's, it's really quite amazing. So the, in, in the book, I created a table of uh, nutrients that have been shown to re-express those hypermethylated tumor suppressor genes. So those protective genes um, for, that, you know, keep us safe from cancer, certain mm. nutrients that can turn them back on. There's a whole table in the book. Nice. That's awesome. Um, but what, what is like the diet then of a uh, good <laughs> DNA methylation and uh, like this anti that helps to yeah. patient? Um, so the diet is very heavy in vegetables, as you can imagine, with some berries. So we want you to be doing about seven cups, maybe even a little bit more than that of, you know, lots of cruciferous greens, um, colorful veggies, um, beets, you know, have a, have a one or two beets a day. You don't have to have a lot of them. Beets have sugar in them for, so for some of us, we're not going to tolerate a lot of beets, but it doesn't, you don't need to have a lot of beets. Um, We do some animal protein. You don't have to, but the study that we conducted was did was not vegetarian or vegan. Um, a, a superstar methylation food is liver. If people are 
are able to access clean liver and they're willing to eat it. It's a, it's a multivitamin in a food matrix. It's got loads of B12 and folate and choline. It's got all of these important players and minerals and so forth. So liver is uh, really helpful. Eggs are other good, really smart nutrients. Um, mushrooms, mushrooms are, you know, other superstars. Uh, again, containing folate, containing choline, you know, just containing other uh, plant compounds that are just fabulous for us. Um, seeds, uh, nuts, uh, proteins like fatty, fatty fish, um, you know, chicken, beef, etc. All of those are fair game. Uh, the diet is not very high in protein. And I have to say one of the one of the pieces that I'm thinking about now, I've, I've you know, I've really embraced resistance training. Um, I did put a caveat in the book. So the, so the program is not very high in protein, but if you're training, if you're an athlete, um, you can certainly consume more. When we're older, we want to consume more. And all of those things I cover in the book. Mm. Um, what else? We didn't, we took out pro-inflammatory foods. So there's no grains in the diet. There's no dairy in the diet. Once you finish the eight weeks though, you're able, if you want to, you can transition back onto those foods. And I talk about how to do it. Um, there's a modest intermittent fasting window, 12 hours on, 12 hours off, very modest. Mm. Uh, hydration is important. You know, if you like green tea, definitely drink it. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, keto leaning. So we want people to be producing some background ketones. We Ketones are, as you know, very potently anti-inflammatory, important for brain health and, you know, a variety of physiologic processes. So that's the diet. Any, any questions on that? Mm. No, I, I, I really like that in that sense that, you know, you do focus on the nutrient density uh, while incorporating um, these, you know, xenohormetic uh, compounds of these epinutrients and, you know, when you look at the you know, calorie, calorie restriction studies, then, yeah, like the apparent, I, I think that the calorie intake is a very important aspect of that. So, like, you know, you need to maintain some sort of like calorie balance and maybe like some periods of, you know, calorie restriction. So you want to get, you know, as many nutrients and as many of these metal donors from as little calories <laughs> almost as possible. So that's right. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Kind of the best example of that, where you get like very lot, a lot of them uh, from very little calories and like green leafy vegetables as well. Yes. Yeah, that's a, a good point. We, we've just worked on um, how one could incorporate the younger you on with even greater caloric restriction if they want to. So maybe at 50% at, at 25%. So we've reduced the caloric for those who want it, we've reduced the cal calories by 25% and showed them mapped out how to do that. Or if they want to do really kind of a modified fast, they can go down a full 50% from our targets. Um, the other piece that we're working on right now is if you want to, for a period of time, increase protein needs uh, for whatever reason, what that would look like. The cool thing about our the Younger You program is that it's modifiable to meet the individual. So we used this in our clinical practice. We used it for years before we studied it. Uh, so we know how to take the principles and um, design them for structure it for the individual. And we're continuing to work on that and to research it. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. I, I would imagine like, you know, genetics also has a pretty important role, especially in methylation. So like your genetics, uh, the MTHFR gene affects the methylation. So does it affect the DNA methylation as well then? It does. It looks like that, that it could. It looks like it, it looks like it could. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if somebody is, uh, if somebody has the MTHFR, particularly the C677, um, uh, and they're homozygous, so they've got one from mom and from dad, they definitely, definitely want to be, you know, using these principles. They want to be incorporating these principles. And there may be a place for actual supplementation with folate and B12 as well in that population. I would not automatically just supplement though. I would start with a food forward approach and, you know, determine with your um, healthcare provider if you need to supplement. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but uh, one of the supplements that you used in the study was also this uh, probiotic. So uh, what's the like, reasoning behind that? And like, how do probiotics affect <laughs> this? Yeah. Process? Well, I mean, pro 
you know, I think our microbiome really runs the world, right? <laughs> they just, you know, the microbiome influences what's happening in every corner of our physiology and every corner of our body. Um, so we need fundamentally a healthy, healthy, healthy microbiome for good gene expression, for healthy epigenetics. Um, the diet is a great diet to foster a healthy microbiome. You know, just fundamentally, it's full of, of, of prebiotic foods and people can bring in fermented foods as well to, to, to continue to help. Um, the probiotic that we used in particular is one that has some evidence behind it for uh, potentially increasing bacterial production of folate. So a healthy microbiome makes a multivitamin. It makes B12, a folate, B6. It makes, um, it can make um, B1, B2, et cetera. We just, we, biotin, we can make our gut microbiome, a good gut microbiome can make all of these incredibly important and necessary nutrients. Um, so we gave lactobacillus plantarum to our, our participants, um, just hoping that it would support folate production. And in fact, we did significantly increase circulating methylfolate in our study participants. We can't say conclusively it was the probiotic because they were eating a folate dense diet as well. Um, but the, the, the combination, uh, we can say, you know, influenced mm. it and really increased it. So mm. yes, mm. we did, we did a probiotic. We also used a greens powder. Um, and this was just simply to give people a little extra polyphenols, you know, just give them a, just dose them up a little bit more. Uh, even though they were already ingesting quite a few, we just, we really wanted to, to push that piece. Mm. Yeah. That's uh, yeah. I, I do think that, you know, like powder is probably you're going to get more concentrated and it's much harder to you know, eat, let's say seven servings of uh, these uh, vegetables themselves. Uh, whereas you can get it quite relatively easily, the same amount from uh, just a few servings of the uh, grease powder. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's a lot of veggies. I mean, I generally into the office bring, you know, a very large glass container of, you know, of my veggies, of my younger you target nutrients and kind of nosh on it, you know, throughout my day. Mm, yeah. Um, what about the um, aspect of um, you know, stress and those kind of things? How do those affect aging? Yeah. So as I, as I say in the book, I think stress is gasoline on the fire of aging. I think of, I think stress may be one of the biggest pro aging factors, especially as we experience it here in the West, we tend to be sedentary. We're behind our desks, you know, or behind our computers all day, stressed out in a full fight or flight mode, but we're sedentary. I mean, it's just so potentially toxic. There is healthy like, you know, just to go back to your I, thinking about hormesis, there's, you know, some stress, the stress of exercise, obviously, is incredibly healthy. Um, stress can, it, it, you know, in short bursts, stress can be motivating and very empowering. But this chronic, toxic stress of, you know, poor relationships or inadequate connection or, you know, un difficulty at work or and sedentary lifestyle, et cetera, you know, just this, this combination, I think, is highly toxic. Um, uh, the, the clock that we use, so the Horvath 2013 clock that we used in our study, a full 25% of the methylation uh, sites used in that clock are influenced by um, glucocorticoids, are influenced by our stress hormones. Hmm. There's no um, other factor, to my knowledge, that has as profound you know, and far reaching influence on any clock. So that just strikes me. It, it's, it's, it seems illustrative of the potential power of uh, stress of, of excess glucocorticoid release to really drive aging. And we can see it, you know, in the literature, the pro aging, the pro aging effect um, of chronic stress, total life stress, et cetera. Uh, also the association with chronic diseases of aging as well. Um, and conversely, we see the benefits of, of meditation, of, of activities that turn the volume down on stress, the benefits of exercise, the benefits of Tai Chi, of yoga, et cetera. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. 
Uh, I think it's yeah, very easy to get overly stressed in the modern world and many people yeah, don't have a good way to like, you know, reduce the stress or cope with it. So they may like, because of that, revert to like some sort of toxic habits or uh, unhealthy habits that, uh, you know, kind of make them even less healthy in that sense. Yeah, like coping strategies, eating really poor foods, you know, like high carbohydrate or, you know, drinking excessive amounts of alcohol, etc. Yeah, mm. totally. Becoming depressed, requiring medication. I mean, it's really, it's a challenging, slippery slope. Probably the grim age clock that you might have on your wall might be stressful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yes, it's a slippery slope. You know, it people talk about stress, you know, it consumes us. It's you know, we're, we're discussing how stressed out we are all the time. And it's like, we're powerless over it. Like we're victims of stress. We can't do anything about it. But the reality is, is that we can, we can, and it doesn't take a lot. I mean, really one of the coolest things I wrote about in the book and, you know, was that just one exercise event can have a favor, can have favorable changes on gene expression. Like you don't have to be a, you know, trained triathlete you know, or a Tour de France finisher or something like that. You do not, you absolutely don't need to be that. Just one movement showed beneficial changes. Mm. We can see favorable changes on a single meditation effort on, on gene expression. Now, one needs to continue the practice to yield the full benefit, but it, it's, it doesn't take a lot. We just have to do it. We have to take it seriously. I mean, I'm a business owner. I'm a mom. I mean, I am so busy and stress is something that I'm vulnerable to. Um, but doing this work, doing this research really caused me to pause and acknowledge the power of it and how essential it is for me in my life to carve out time for self, for really good self-care. Yeah, that's true. Where do, where would you what would you say is like the most important thing uh, out of like the, the the diet the exercise the sleep or the stress mm -hmm. what do you think is like the most what what would accelerate your aging the most or uh, you know improve it I love that question because you know I I, I really don't know <laughs> I love the question though it's kind of you know it's funny I should ask you what you think it is it's I think it says about it. it, it speaks to who we are, I think, as individuals, but that where we're putting our importance. Um, I think, I mean, I guess I, I, the, I think, di I think diet is so far reaching. I, I, I would probably say uh, that it's, 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 it's the biggest variable, but stress is gasoline on the fire of aging. It's, it's incredibly, incredibly powerful. Exercise is more effective and more potent than any anti-aging drug that we have out now. It's just so de de the, the, the success, the power, the, the efficacy of exercise has just been demonstrated in study after study after study after study. So it's hard for me to just to say one. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a combination of everything. Um, but uh, maybe like, I don't know. But like obesity is probably one of the worst ones um, and uh, having like diabetes or something like having like a comorbidity is probably the worst things that will accelerate the epigenetic aging specifically. Yeah. And perhaps it depends on the individual. You know, if you have an individual who eats every day at McDonald's, but they happen to jog, you know, they have an mm -hmm. exercise habit, you know, then clearly for them, diet is the area of focus. Mm. So I mean, it may be, it's just, it may be individual, but, you know, more, more, more research will, mm. you know, will tell. Yeah. How, how much do you think it's possible to, let's say, reverse the, the biological age um, using that? Like how far back? Using, yeah. Using the DNA methylation clock, you know, how, how big of a result could you like expect <laughs> to have? Well, if you're using Yamanaka factors, I mean, I wouldn't want to, or CRISPR technology, you know, doing, you could CRISPR technology is the gene editing software, which I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with. They're able to edit epigenetics now with using CRISPR as well. So if you use something like that, uh, where even, you know, where their time is not right or not ready for use in humans, but, you know, I think, yeah, I think it's possible that we, uh, well, as, as David Sinclair says, the first person to live to be 150 is, is alive now. You know, I think, 
I think the po- the possibility using these aggressive interventions is, you know, is huge. I was reading a book by a scientist, um, Harold Katcher, who is talking about, you know, escape velocity or, or, or immortality. I mean, if you can shave a biologic, if you can reduce your bio age by just one year, every year, mm. you know, you've, you've stopped aging. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, Diet and lifestyle interventions such as ours, you are not going to be, you know, reversing your bio age back to uh, your teens if you were in your 50s yeah. or something like that. You're not going to be turning back the hands of time, you know, outside of the natural bounds of how 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 far back we could go. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Like everything, yeah, that we talked about here, like the mostly the lifestyle and the like exercise and those things they're not going to make you live probably like beyond what is possible for humans naturally but uh, that's right yeah, that's right make it to 100 uh, or 150 and 200 then yeah, you need to do something like yeah crispr or g anything and maybe some a drug. combination yeah, yeah that's right i mean yeah or you know it'll be interesting to start to see the research on using rapamycin and so forth but all of these people whether you're doing crispr or not you still have to eat you know, you still need to move your body, et cetera. So um, I think these foundational principles are essential for all of us, whether or not we want to experiment with CRISPR uh, yeah. or not. Yeah. Well, maybe the solution is to to not eat or, <laughs> or to, to have like this kind of, I don't know, you uh, put yourself into some sort of a, like a pot or whatever where you get IV with all the nutrients all the time. And <laughs> <laughs> so maybe maybe that's kind of the solution. <laughs> um, yeah for some of us i i, I still enjoy living like <laughs> i yeah. still enjoy like being out in the world and yeah, kind experience of with those things um uh, but uh maybe uh, let's talk a bit more about the book so uh what else can people learn from it or yeah anything else yeah so the book goes through the study and how you can actually use it um in enact it yourself we've got all the a ton of recipes, all everything that you need. Uh, if you want to measure, we have a biological age um, self assessment. Uh, so you can take that questionnaire that's in the book, or you can go to our website, youngeryouprogram.com and find the what we call the BASA biological age self assessment. You can find it at youngeryouprogram.com. You can find all actually, there's a bunch of free downloadable stuff. There's all sorts of stuff at that website. Um, but that's in the book. Um, So all of the how-tos of enacting the study, if you want to measure DNA methylation beyond the questionnaire, um, I list labs that you can access to measure biological age. Um, The supplements that we used in the study are covered in the book. Beyond that, supplements that I think are smart for everyday use are covered. Once people finish the program, they can transition to an everyday version. And so the everyday version is outlined in the book. There's recipes for that, et cetera. if you've got certain issues, if you're sensitive to various foods, if you've got inflammatory bowel disease, or if you've got SIBO, or if you've got, uh, you know, you can't tolerate certain nutrients, et cetera, uh, how, to, how to layer younger you principles is covered. I also talk about really the other, through the lifespan, epigenetics is always very important. And there are times when it's more important. Uh, and I talk about why. So embryogenesis, so pregnancy, preconception, um, early infancy, huge, important times, what we want to be thinking about. I even designed something called the Younger You Hybrid, which is the nutrient outline for consuming the diet preconception or during pregnancy or just postpartum, actually for mom and dad. Epigenetic marks are heritable, uh, so you can pass down traits to your offspring. And I talk about that and, and how we might think about um, optimizing that, you know, especially if we're going to be having kids. Um, so the book covers a lot, 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 lot. Uh, I, I go into detail on, on sleep and give sleep hacks and exercise and meditation and, you know, the other practices that are helpful. So you know, all the, everything that we've covered here today is covered extensively in the book and the references are there. And, um, you know, thinking about epigenetics throughout the lifespan is also covered in the book. It's, it's really comprehensive. It's huge. It's, I probably should have written two, two books, but it's all in one. (laughs) 
Yeah. Have you measured your own number DNA method? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I sure have. So my last measurement, my bio age was 41, put me at 41 years and I'm 55 chronologically. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I did I did it uh, two years ago and uh, I was 25, my chronological age, but my the, the test said that I was 16. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. Results, uh, but yeah, obviously you have much more, uh, I think it's much uh, harder to achieve such a result when you're uh, 50 years old already. Well, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I became a mom, as I talk about in the book, I became a mom old, older in life. I was, you know, just really career focused for, for many years. And so I have a very strong motivation to say, stay biologically as young as possible. Um, And I'll be doing, I mean, I actually do an annual battery of tests and I'll be looking at it again soon. So we'll see the book, the whole book launch was intense. It was so I was so, 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 so busy with interviews and we'll see how all of that influenced my bio age. <laughs> Hopefully it's still pretty good. <laughs> well, let's hope it's not going to get to like, I don't know, 15 or, <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. that, or where you're like, yeah, literally like 40 years younger than. Uh... Well, you know, what's interesting, like just so one of the things I talk about in the book um, at towards the end, actually, I think it's the final chapter. Um, if we do use CRISPR or Yamanaka and we really bring ourselves back to teen years, um, you know, when we're older, you know, there's something called biological embedding. And this is the experience, the psychic experience of life influences gene expression as well. So trauma, um, but also resilience, uh, connection, you know, the, the what we experience, the, the, the psychic experience, experience of our lives are coded um, on our je- epigenome as well. And I think about myself now. So you're in your 20s still. I think about myself now as, a, as, as in my 50s and when I was in my 20s. And I was a different person in my 20s. I've learned a lot in the, you know, in the subsequent 25 years. I'm, in, you know, I'm calmer. I'm less, you know, there's just, there's some favorable changes that have happened. And, and the question is, if we do use some of these radical interventions like CRISPR or or, or so forth, will we erase that hard earned maturation? And I think that's a very legitimate question. There are plenty of individuals, you know, aggressive biohackers who are already experimenting with CRISPR and probably trying to figure out how to experiment with Yamanaka factors, you know, and what kind of humans will be, will we become, you know, what, what will we become? I mean, if we do lose some of that maturation, some of the development of, you know, of ethics, of thoughtfulness that I, that I just didn't have when I was younger. I mean, I know I'm a better mom, you know, I'm way more patient. I mean, I was way more self-absorbed when I was, when I was younger. I mean, hopefully you're not, but you know, I was. And so anyway, these are questions that we have to really, really have and be, and be thinking about before we jump in and turn ourselves back to, you know, a, society of 15 year olds i mean can you imagine <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean the world will be probably worse if it's only 15 year olds <laughs> <laughs> it might be uh, yeah. nuclear weapons and those things <laughs> yeah it's like no impulse control you yeah. know it, it, so we, we these are these are very real cautions mm, yeah well that's of course yeah very important and you know it's not it's not about that you know aging is bad or or that uh, that we don't or that no one should be old or whatever it's more like there's ways to uh, basically prevent a lot of the degeneration and uh, the ailments that come with age and uh, if we can you know you know basically make people healthier and live a bit longer then yeah why not do it mm-hmm. i agree with you i agree with you not everybody agrees with you i mean there are some people who think we should be immortal mm. and colonizing mars right <laughs> I mean, really, that's actually where I was going with Harold Catcher. You know, he's, yeah, there's some, there's some really radical thinking in this, in Mm. this space. I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of depending. I mean, some people are very excited about it. It's concerning to me, (laughs) some of it. Yeah. Um, Well, it's been great uh, talking with you. Um, Before I ask my last question, where can people learn more about you and your work and uh, where can they get the book? Yeah, so they can grab the book wherever books are sold. I mean, Amazon is obviously a big, you know, international source for it. Um, youngeryouprogram.com, youngeryouprogram.com, that's our hub. 
they can uh, join us in a uh, in, in groups, if they want to do this with us, they can access our physician team here if they want to have a physician guided experience with the younger you, um, or they can just get information on do it yourself, you know, and we have an app that people can um, access as well, uh, the supplements and so forth. So there's lots of information uh, over at Younger You program. And there's the BASA score. So the biological age subjective assessment people can take um, and then there's other freebies. We've got recipes like holiday recipes and just, you know, lots of cool stuff over there. Nice. So we're going to put the links in the show notes. And uh, my last question is, um, what's this one piece of advice or habit that you wish you adopted sooner? One advice or habit that I wish I had adopted sooner. I would say, um, d- d- look, you know, taking the longevity, like really incorporating the longevity science into, into my life. I mean, I'm glad I'm doing it now. Um, but you know, I think you're onto something doing it in your twenties. I was not in my (laughs) twenties. I wasn't living the worst life, but I, I, you know, I think you're, you're, you're wise to be thinking about these things now. Mm. Yeah, well, maybe actually, maybe there will be some like maybe benefit to having like some unhealthy period through like hormesis or, or something like that. So we, we don't even know that. Yeah, but <laughs> I have tried to make the better decisions for sure. Well, younger, I mean, there's the, the your generation, you guys are adopting stuff early. I mean, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see, you know, where you are when you're my age and older. Mm. Yeah, well, only time will tell. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, well, it was a great uh, talking with you and fascinating conversation. Um, yeah. Looking forward to your future work. Yeah. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. We've got more studies co- that we're working on um, for publication and we'll continue to research. All right. That's it for this episode. Make sure to click a like and subscribe. Leave us a review on iTunes. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.